Hey, I made it. Well, we made it live again on LinkedIn. Got a cup of coffee ready to rock and roll for this session. I'm super excited, but who am I? My name is Van der Puchert and I'm a creative entrepreneur all the way from Poland, a South African. But there's a long story about this whole Polish thing and I'll get into it. A um, bit of context, um, you might have seen me around on LinkedIn uh, posting all kinds of things around design tools and exciting design things that I keep on geeking out about. And I thought, you know what? I can't take all the credit for this. There's a whole bunch of awesome people behind the scenes doing this. So I decided to do all these live shows or, well, this is the second one, uh, and uh, bring on some of the people that uh, has shaped the way that I think, has created some of the tools. And today is a huge one for me. Um, today I'm going to bring on soon, he's waiting in the, I think they call it the bleachers or stage left, uh, a good friend of mine, Jeff Parks. Um, also, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do this spiel about Jeff because Jeff is actually one of the, and I posted that in the caption, is one of the OGs of user experience design. And in fact, back in the day, we called it information architecture. Now, for all the youngsters who are confused, just stick with me on this. Now, Jeff has been a uh, uh, leader of the board at the Information Architecture Institute. He's done podcasting, um, he's brought the platform of user experience design and conversations around com ex user experience design um, to everybody in the world, even South Africans. And um, he's done a lot, uh, two consultancies, he's worked as a design leader, he's been in the, in the factory room, he's, uh, he understands psychology, behavioral science, all these fancy things. But before I go into Speaking to Jeff, I want to talk a little bit about this perspective that I have on Jeff. Now, a couple of years ago, Jeff did a talk around um, how um, we need to lift up designers and uh, do our part to bring new designers into the world of design and inspire other people. And uh, the thing is with Jeff is that he lives up to that. And I am a result of that. Um, just to tell you a little bit of a story, and I think this is inspirational because this is how what you do and the content that you create and the things that you do out in the, in the world can inspire and affect other people. Um, I remember driving in Johannesburg, South Africa to a new job um, and, and I had to drive very far, listen to, uh, to the radio, and I started hearing about this interesting world of user experience design and information architecture. Now, back in the day in South Africa, we didn't have places where we could study it. I mean, yes, we got our hands in a few O'Reilly books and read that. But it's actually Jeff that created a window into the world of user experience design and information architecture that actually got me into this. Taught me a lot of things because of all the conversations that he had. And then also, at some stage, I reached out to him. And this is like me reaching out to this famous dude. And uh, he started helping me and inspiring me and getting into this, into this world of user experience design. I don't want to ramble too much, but in the end, he also got me on stage at an event in Poland. Now, I don't know, like sometimes I love him for it. Sometimes we don't speak for months. But because of Jeff, I came to Poland for the first time from South Africa and I got stuck here. They haven't gotten rid of me yet. And uh, therefore, I want to stop rambling and I want to bring on screen my good friend Jeff Box all the way from Ottawa, Canada. Jeff, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Werner, very kind, uh, all the words. And, uh, and, and likewise, you've been an inspiration to me and, and all the people that I've, uh, that I've learned from and, and helped over the years. Uh, it's very much a reciprocal process. So thank you for inviting me to your show and this discussion. And uh, hopefully we can share some interesting conversation yeah. to help some other people. But before we get into that, Jeff, because you're far and way too um, uh, humble, um, I just wanted to like riff a little bit on you know the whole idea of where you came from and some of the things you've done. Because I mean, I actually went out and I started to try and find some of the episodes of the old podcast, and I I couldn't track them down. There's a few episodes on on, on uh, boxes and arrows, but I mean, I think it was in 20, 2007 where you were on the board for the IA Institute. Don't you want to just give us a little bit of background? Because I mean. There was all kinds of things happening, like the old, the old school kind of UXers back then and, and, and how you got to this point and how you got into the whole podcasting thing. And I'll keep quiet now and give you a bit of chance just to give a bit of background. Yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> I was, um, I was uh, getting into the, the field of information architecture early on because this is when uh, around 2003, 2002, when, when Google 
was just coming on board. Um, so I'm an old man, as you can tell by the airline and whatnot. Um, but um, I discovered podcasting by a former, uh, there was a program in the United States called MTV or Music TV. And in Canada, there was a reciprocal one called Music Television, uh, Much Music. And it was basically just a 24 hour a day, seven day a week show where they showed music videos on, on TV all day. And a former MTV jockey, as they called them, was named Adam Curry. And Adam Curry uh, did this thing called podcasting. And it was really interesting. He talked about his life. He talked about his experiences in business and other things. But there's just something about Adam. It, I woke up every day and started my morning listening to Adam. And then when I got into the discipline, um, I started reading blog posts because back then blog posts were the main medium that everybody used uh, to communicate ideas. Yeah. And I started finding a pattern that was a little troubling. Um, there were a few thought leaders, uh, you know, maybe a dozen or so at the time in the different disciplines. And the ideas that would be sharing by different people, 99 times out of 100, you know, the, the thought leader was just sharing whether they agreed or disagreed with the post. Um, but the troubling thing wasn't their opinion. They were just sharing their experience. It was fine. But it was sort of the group mentality that we see on social media today, where if a thought leader agrees with it, everybody agrees with it. Or if they disagreed with it, everybody disagreed with it. And it was such a new medium um, that I wanted to try to, to provide greater context to people. And the way in which I could start to do that would be through potentially through podcasting. And so I picked that up uh, and learned XML. I learned how all the audio uh, oh, worked, all the streaming. And that got re me recognized by Box and Narrows, Chris Baum and Christina Woodkey, who started that. And they said, would you like to do podcasting for Boxes and Narrows? Uh, so I did, I went to the IA summit in Miami in 2006, 2007. And so I was, it was a great opportunity and it was never about being an influencer, uh, like today because influencers didn't really exist back then. The intent, and I hope the way it came across was that it wasn't about me. It was about trying to get the discipline as a whole to be educated worldwide. And the first publication at the IA summit went up that day. I got a couple up and they went from a few hundred people hearing their ideas to 80,000 worldwide. Exactly. Um, and to me, that's what it was about. It was about trying to get more ideas out there so more people could get access to them and, and learn about them. Uh, Johnny Holland was an interaction design magazine by Jerome Van Gill, who's in Amsterdam, that focused on interaction design. Um, so I really used the medium to try to educate people and, and to try to help others. And then getting invited to talk at conferences, um, the talks that I've focused on really had nothing to do with best practices, but we're always about trying to tell stories to inspire people to think differently and to try to collaborate more effectively. So, Man, what a rich, And the thing is, I would be, uh, I mean, I hope you're not going to slap me around for this one, Jeff, um, but we'll talk about that later. But uh, I was going to make this joke and I thought, no, I shouldn't, but I'm going to go there. You know me. Um, I was thinking, because the, the thing is, I have to also mention that you're half of a very awesome couple. Uh, there's a lady in the other yes. room there, uh, Christina Mauser, who is uh, quite famous herself, right? So the other day I was thinking like, I mean, are you guys like the Beckhams of experience design? I'll leave it there. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know about that, but she is, she is brilliant. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, she's, she's, defi she's definitely the better half of me, for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Jeff, I mean, uh, like we, we, I just have you for a little bit, bit of time and I, I want to get back to kind of the, the topic of this and why we're doing this conversation in the first place, like we discussed. And um, I mean, you've seen me around and you've kind of shook, shook your head um, with me running around with like little design tools like this and doing, this is a new one coming up soon. And talking about, you know, going into workshops, collaboration, sharing, and that's kind of really a fuzzy area to play around in. And then, of, of, of course, we also recently have a lot of conversations around where when you go into, you know, organizations, you know, organizations don't necessarily like the fuzziness and they start pushing you towards systems, processes, recipes. Not saying that that is wrong, of course, but, you know, like you have to find some kind of balance. And I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts around, you know, all the tool things and the fuzziness and then trying, and you always say getting to done, like, uh, if you can riff a little bit on that and, and how you see some of this actually come to play. 
Yeah, well, I think over the last two decades, there's been an evolution of of the of the disciplines themselves. They were they were independent of one another. Information architecture was a discipline, and then user experience really focused on usability testing. In fact, the, the yeah. community of practice was the Usability Professional Association or the UPA, and over time, that evolved into the UXPA, the User Experience Professional Association. So we moved from usability testing to understand why people are succeeding and failing, sort of like empathy maps today, you know, why people are thinking and feeling and saying and doing the things they're doing, um, to a much more broad construct of what UX is. And, and in, mo in a lot of cases, we've gotten away from that. There's now, people are now hiring for UX researchers to do that usability piece. And a lot of UX designers are in, in some product companies that I've talked to in, in at different places like Facebook and Apple and other places, they're not even they're not even really looking at in some cases not all cases but in some cases they're only looking at the page they're not looking at the flows per se um, so the concept of what it meant to be a UX designer even 10 years ago forget about 20 years ago when I had to learn code and Photoshop and all the other things just to get to now yeah we've now really formalized the processes that we're doing and and product companies and and the market and sort of the product market fit construct. We're really about just getting to done. And good enough is good enough because we can fix it later. And that is fine. But the only time, in my professional opinion, it's that's not okay is if you create a backlog that's so large that you can't pivot. And the platforms that we're building over time on the back end, it becomes so tightly coupled and complex that in my experience, companies really aren't mitigating certain risks if they don't decide to look deeper, whether it's from an IA perspective, um, because even the GM of IBM, Rob Thomas, has come out over the last few years saying there is no AI without IA, because yeah. the machine is learning based on the context of the words the corporation is providing, not on necessarily on the words and the mental model of the human beings that are using the tools. <clears throat> so I think that if the focus is on getting done, that's fine. That's the reality of the way business is working today. Then I think that the designer or the UX professional uh, and the product managers and the executives need to understand how they need to be thinking about innovation, when to be bringing innovation to the table uh, and, and realizing it's, it's, it's we, again, we formalized things like agile and design thinking to the extent that there's a lot of crossover but the, dis, the things that are dissimilar from them in terms of the way they approach them and how and when they implement them are at odds. And yeah. that's what's creating this sort of chaos, I think. And, and Jeff, I, I'm gonna quickly, I'm gonna call up that one graphic you, sh you shared with me of the six stages, because I think that visualizes kind of what you're talking about in an interesting way. Um, let me just see if I can do my technology right here. It should pop up, there you go. Um, and I think what you've just touched on is on the, on, the, on, on, on the one side, you have this formalization, but it starts off with the perception and then the conception and then goes all the way down to formalization. Can you, can you talk a little bit about this and how that fits into what you said just before around uh, getting to done and getting to processes and all these kind of things? Yes. Yeah, so, so over the years, as you pointed out, with respect to my experience over 20 years, I've, I've done all of the journey maps and card sorting and all the things you can think of over a 20 year career. So tr if you're not, if you're starting out in your career and you're listening to the show, imagine putting yourself 20 years into the future and having all of those experiences, like you've done all the IA, the interaction designs you've ex presented to executives. So over the last several years, what I've done is I've started to reach out to different disciplines like psychology, philosophy, and even art, like artists, great artists, and what uh, to start to think about ways in which I can communicate ideas to other people that I hold in my head, right? I don't, I don't share this framework outwardly with people and make it explicit because if you make it explicit, then it becomes this formalized construct that people tag as business transformation yeah. and it gets locked down. So the first stage, this is from Robert Irwin, who's an artist, and he defines this of concept of these stages of how we make sense of the world or what he calls sense making. Um, and there are six stages. The first one is perception. So, you know, you, you have, uh, you've used Lego, for example, and Lego serious play. And the way I think about perception, the way Erwin describes it is looking at all the parts on the table. So instead of building a specific uh, box set of something from Lego, like a Millennium Falcon or something, if you're a Star Wars fan, all you're doing is pouring a whole bunch of pieces on the table 
and you're saying we need to come up with a solution that solves pro this particular problem. So we're not putting any labels on it. We're just putting all the parts on the table and everyone's trying to make sense of things. That's the first stage, which is called perception. The second one is conception. Um, and at that uh, point, Erwin talks about uh, starting to isolate unnamed zones of focus. So people are trying to make sense of the world around them and they're starting to ask a range of questions from clarifying what the problem is all the way over to questioning the value of what others are actually putting on the table. Yeah. Right. So as I walk through these things, you can think in your own mind, you start doing these things at work about, yeah, okay, this is, well, now we're at conception, right? Then from there, they move on to forming. And the third stage is forming and they start to label the ideas. And, and this is where we need to be really careful and where design thinking and where innovation starts to slowly, you know, it gets harder and harder as you go through these stages to back up because at the forming stage, they start to label ideas. And so imagine a product manager, an engineer, a designer, an executive sitting around a table. They all have different ways of labeling things and the concepts and the context that's provided to them start to, you know, people go, well, wait a minute. I don't, that's not what this is at this point. Yeah. Um, and so we really have to start to, you know, pull back a little bit because at this point you can also keep questioning for clarity because nobody's been assigned any specific responsibilities at this point. You're still trying to organize things. At the four stage formful, Erwin talks about how people begin to quote unquote architect and structure the ideas in an effort to provide themselves, others uh, with deeper context and meaning. And they begin to categorize things. So if we go back to the Lego concept, right? you start to, people start building things out and they start looking at things and going, oh, okay, we're building at a high level, we're building a vehicle. And then other people go, well, great, we need to build a vehicle that goes on the land that might be able to travel across oceans or maybe able to fly, right? And so we start to narrow down what these things, these things could be yeah. in terms of possibilities. And then at the fifth stage, the formal discussions quickly evolved from the abstract concepts like up and down, so whether it flies or whether it stays on the ground, to literally what constitutes a good outcome versus a bad outcome, right? So now we're starting to get into, um, you know, if you were an agile, you'd almost be at the, at the grooming phase right now. You'd be planning things out in terms of making those final decisions. And the last one is, is uh, formalization. But before I get to that, in the, another way to think about the formal stage uh, metaphorically speaking, is there is a, a, a real genetic condition called, or condition in the mind called echinotopsia. And echinotopsia is motion blindness. Okay. So motion blindness is where, uh, general motion blindness is where people don't see things moving in a, a person moving in a fluid motion or state. They'll see stutter steps of the person moving in frames. Uh, but gross echinotopsia is very much illustrating sort of the formal stage of this process. Gross echinotopsia is where, you can, where an individual with this condition can see static objects as they are. But if I was to take a, a mug of water and start pouring it, that fluid would actually freeze from their perspective Damn. in real okay. time, even though the water would keep flowing. So the metaphor around this is that you get to a formal stage, and it's very difficult to see any other ideas moving in a fluid state that you could potentially conceive because you're so focused on the objects around you that you can't conceive of any other ideas coming into the process at this point. And the last stage is formalization where people just stop questioning what's been out there and, and stop questioning the view of what the object is. And it's absolute irrefutable good or, you know, in terms of this is what we're doing. This is what we're shipping. This is how we're getting to this point. And, and, and this is obviously, you know, something that you can listen to, and I've talked about it at a very, very high level. Yeah. But if you start to think about these things in a in a in a in a real world way, you can start to understand, you know, instead of pushing for design thinking, which is a formalized process over the last two decades, pushing against the agile methodology because it's a formal formalized process for how we're building products and shipping products. It's, it's, it's a way of stepping back. So there's, there's a lot of different frameworks that I've looked at. This is one of them that I just shared with you last week and you said, let's talk about this. So, okay. Yeah. But it's, it's a way of holding it in my mind so that I can ask questions, so I can understand what the goals of the executive team are. What are the goals of the product manager? You know, it's a way of talking to the engineering team and saying, 
you know, I've seen the roadmap. Can you tell me from a design perspective, what is a, without saying it, but in my mind going like, what is a formalized construct? Like, what am I potentially going to be able to generate that you're going to come back to me and go, that would take a year to build versus no, all these other things we can do in two week sprints and get that out in the next release. So, and then also looking at the idea of, okay, well, when can we bring journey mapping in? I had a I had a I had a brilliant design team that I was that I was leading recently, and there was one individual who's really passionate about doing research, and I knew based on where they were at in terms of what they were trying to do with a particular product, that the timing wasn't right to do things like journey mapping and personas and whatnot. But there was a time in the product where they wanted to start evolving the product further down the line, rather than focusing on onboarding. But talking with the engineering team, I knew that. And with the customers, I knew that they weren't inputting enough data and engaging with the product enough to get the outcome that the executive team was hoping for. So by doing journey mapping, and they did a brilliant job, they brought people inside the company to, I mean, it was this huge wall of full of information, but it was beautifully illustrating the fact that if they want, didn't start with onboarding and they didn't get enough data in at the front end, then trying to get people to get an outcome that would help guide the customer in terms of making decisions for their employees at that point it was going to not produce the results they were promising so to slow down and illustrate that that's where design thinking comes in so basically i was saying let's get them back to the conception stage of yeah. this process right so they can move into the forming and formful and so that the executives could make a strong business case through that through that exercise. Because also, I mean, like, sorry, I just need to like also get clarity here, right? Because what you're saying, like what I'm understanding is like one of the big challenges that we're facing now, if I understand the framework right, is that, mm -hmm. you know, it, I, I understand all the steps going through the formalization, but once you hit that, is it of your opinion that we are struggling, or not everybody, but a lot of teams are struggling to, like when they're in the formalization phase, and they see, uh oh, something might be wrong, or someone has a kind of feeling that something is not right, to then reverse out of it. Like, is the tendency to rather close eyes and just get get it out the door? Is, is am I understanding what you're saying right? It's like if you see yeah. the problem, let's reverse back to conceptual, and and go back to research or. Yeah, I think so, and I and I think I think at a at a, at a in house level, yes, and I think there are times when you need to work with. Uh, product managers and, uh, and uh, you know, if you have the experience and you know, um, you know, what best practices are, right? Like we, we know from 10 years plus of research, people scroll, you know, the fold on the page was something when we only had desktops where it was an analogous to a paper, people would only read the top fold of the paper, yeah. the top part of the paper, right? Remember that? I remember right? that, well, you know, yeah. Well, around, what is it now? 14 years ago, I did an interview with uh, the head of design at uh, America Online, AOL, I don't know if anyone remembers that company, but anyway. Uh, You've got mail. <laughs> there, you, there you go. Well, you, you do. Yes. Yeah, see, you know. I'm an old uh, guy. <laughs> I, yes. I had a great great discussion with Melissa Turchini, and she was the head of, of research at the time. And they looked at 50,000 people using their, using their site at any given time. And the research proved over and over again that people scroll. So I guess, you know, at this point in my career, I think my responsibility is to help the next generation do better and to get to better in my mind means you're you're helping them understand that the things you're finding online you don't need to keep looking at the things that are online you don't need to keep coming back to these things we've already proven that people scroll we already know that so let's yeah. not focus on that let's focus on how we get to that next stage and i think at a at a discipline level i think i think you know, design thinking and agile and the way in which we build products have become so formalized, very much like the Industrial Revolution factory, that we're not taking the time to slow down long enough to come together and talk about, you know, what could be next, right? We're, yeah. we're, so, we're so focused on fixing issues all the time to get that next product out the door, but we're not focusing on larger problems. And that, that's okay for the short term, but over the long term, in many respects, at least in my experience, that, that prevents us from moving products and, and services forward and, and thinking about other ideas because we're comfortable in the way we're working. And people don't like to change. 
and myself included, it's very difficult to change. But you know, for this comfortable in the way in which we're working now, I think that should be a sign that it's it's time to start thinking differently about the way we do things. Great point. And Jeff, before we continue with this, I see uh, the inter the internet gods are letting us down because your camera is frozen. I mean, your audio is still <laughs> coming great, but like. Let's uh, maybe just turn your camera on and off and let's see if you, I can get you back because um, I'd love to see your face. Yay, it worked. There we go. Okay. <laughs> just restart the camera. <laughs> Great stuff. Now, Jeff, like, I mean, we've kind of stated some of the, like, the challenges here and I think this framework really unpacks nicely. It also kind of gave me a bit of a foundation because as much as I'm having fun with all these tools and, and like, I'm still going to geek out, geek out I can see where they sit on this kind of on this framework and how we move towards that that six and then out the door shipping right now um i mean you've faced a few challenges um you know and you've seen these things now what are some of the things that you can do to to kind of help the teams is it is it about more communication between the with the dev guys is it is it the you know is it does it come from top down like what do you have you seen in the market what is what can be done well, I think in product companies, they use roadmaps to sort of guide the, the direction for different products over the course of a year and, and try to understand what's what's going on. And I think that product managers have taken over uh, a lot of the product. And I think the concept of ownership is is a big, big, it's not a problem. It's it, it can create difficulties because if you define ownership as you are ultimately accountable for the outcome of the product without considering the fact that you've got an entire team around you to do design to you know, help you make the interaction smoother with respect to the development. Um, I think that we're at a point now where if you're a designer, I think it's really important for you uh, to have, have meetings with the engineering team, understand the development process, understand the roadmap, right? If the product managers really need to make sure that if they're building a roadmap, that, that it's not just them that owns the roadmap, but the engineering team owns the roadmap, the designers own the roadmap, they're, the executive team understands and agrees that, yep, yeah, we're, we're on board with this and, and we can move forward. And, and because we're in a hurry to get to done, frameworks like the one I shared with you, along with others that I've, that I've considered over the years that have worked for me, is really about communicating, you know, an understanding of, you know, maybe at this point we could start to visualize things like journey mapping and, and mapping in general is a great visual medium yeah. for helping to illustrate your understanding of the flow of things and then to bring engineers and, and other people together right so it's it's not just about preaching about best practices and process from a designer's point of view but it's about understanding what the business is trying to achieve working with the product managers and engineering team to understand what's possible um, if you're a designer, get on calls with customers and, and question for clarity. Product managers that I've talked to, uh, they're great. I'm picking on product managers. I'm not. I'm just using them as an example. I've worked with incredible ones, but I've also worked with other ones that feel they need to own everything. And, and when they talk to customers, you know, some product managers will tell and sell, right, the customer about what their problems are, where when I would have follow-up meetings with them, it would be more about, you know, the first, first 30 minutes, the floor is yours. Talk up to me about whatever you want about the product. I'm just here to listen. And you start to, it, when I do that, I start to hear patterns emerging. They'll talk about things like, well, our employees aren't engaging with the product as much as we want them to. Uh, it takes too many clicks to get to somewhere. And then, so that allows me the opportunity to say, okay, well, help me to understand, you know, how do you define engagement? So is it is it that they're not using the product for the amount of time you're hoping for, you're not seeing the outcomes. And if you're not seeing the outcomes you want, how are you measuring or defining those within your company? Because when you do that and you have enough conversations with customers, you can go, okay, well, we have three other customers that are measuring outcomes completely differently than you are, right? So getting yeah. to the heart of that, you know, I even had one customer say to me, well, you know, this, the, the, your product looks great on an iPhone but it actually works on Android, <laughs> right? That's, so, I mean, that's a disaster for the designer to hear, right? But I mean, it's also right, a disaster from a business perspective. It, it, it is, and, and the, the, in my career, me, for me, user experience is all about understanding why, right? It's being curious to understand why. It's about, you know, even when things I design, I wanna go test my assumptions. 
I'm assuming that what I've created is great, but then I'll go and do research and talk to people and go, oh, 60% of my assumptions were absolutely wrong, right? So, but I get excited about that. I don't get depressed or sad or nervous or stressed about it going, oh, I've made a mistake. No, no, no. The only way we're going to evolve and differentiate ourselves in any market, because every market has unlimited choice. Unlike 20 years ago, you know, you, it doesn't matter what you're in, even banking, right? You could be with a major bank, you could be with Wealth Simple, you could be with Quest Trade now. You have so many options in every industry. Yeah. How do you differentiate yourself in the market? And if you're solving fundamental problems for people and understanding what those are, then you know you can that's how you can differentiate yourself in the market. Otherwise, what's gonna pull people away from one service to go to your service or another service? You've got to be exceptionally better for people to actually make that change, which is, again, another example of how people get to a formalized state in terms of what they constitute good as a customer, even you and me, like what do you, what apps do you like using? And why would you move away from one app to another, especially if you have to pay for it, even if it's only a few dollars? Exactly. And Jeff, it's actually interesting how you're talking about this, right? Because there's, there's a lot of things that jump to mind and um, like just as an observation, because I want to I want to mention a few things. It says when I when I was actually doing research for this, because I actually attempted to do a better profile than the one I did at the beginning, and I looked at some of your interviews, and the one thing that surprised me that you know maybe this gives something away about how engaged I am in the design community is that um, you had a conversation in 2007, and I think you still remember this with someone talking about how UX people are actually moving into uh, product management. And I, I was under the impression that was a relatively new conversation because I've been dabbling in the product management world. And uh, the, the, for me, the concept was quite new. But 2007 already? Um, whoa, am I just behind the time? Or was, just, was that just a, con a conversation that keeps on going? No, well, I think, I think the, the concept of product companies have really grown since that time. Right. A lot of companies now that are technology companies are defining themselves as product companies. They're defining themselves through the, the agile methodology of, of shipping and engineering led. Um, so that was a conversation with Chris Baum, who was the editor in chief for Box Narrows and a, a UX designer. And uh, and Jeff Lash, who uh, is when he brought that up to me the other day, he is still a product manager to this day. Um, so I think. I don't think you're behind the time. Well, you might be behind the times, Ferner. I have no idea, man. That you, you're a little behind the times in some things. But, I'm you know, behind with the haircuts okay. as well. But anyway, <laughs> that's a whole different yeah. story. <laughs> we all have different problems. This is that's not one for me. Um, so no, I don't think you're behind the times. I think that you know you could look at it and say, well, maybe they were a little bit of a, ahead of the time. But again, the product manager role has taken on um, taken on so many different um, veins in terms of responsibilities ownership over the years, it's really grown to beyond just, uh, you know, you know, talking to customers and saying, let's, let's understand what the problem is and hand yeah. it off. And, and so it's, it's very different. It's like, it's like the UX profession, right? You user experience used to be about doing usability research and design. And now those things have broken off and every company uh, values and tends to look at those, those constructs and those disciplines, excuse me, in, in different veins. Yeah, and the other thing is that also what you, what you mentioned. I mean, when you when you talk when you spoke about the whys, right? So, I think you know when I was driving up and down listening to you back in the day, the one big aha moment in the in the car was like, hey, maybe we should have a conversation with our customers. Like, go figure. They can maybe tell us a few things. Or if we build something, we build it really rough, and let's go test it. Let's see what happens. But something that I've noticed, um, and and I think it's maybe a maybe it's more than the younger people coming in because they, they are kind of schooled in this, in this space is that there is sometimes a bit of a lack in understanding of, you know, the business value of what you're doing. So it might be, it, may, it might make amazing sense. And I'm, I'm not saying build horrible products, never. I mean, you have to have that foundation. But what I'm also hearing from you is that, and maybe this is a conversation also with the product manager is that, hey, like, you know, what we do needs to make business sense. We still need to build a profitable company. But then also that's the one why, like, you know, think about the business side of this, the business perspective, but then also the why speaking to the developers, right? Like if you speak to the technology yeah. guys, sometimes the why is like you said before, like it could take two years to actually change to what you wanted to do. 
Yeah, and I, I think that speaks to a more fundamental human condition. You know, the fact that I think everybody wants to feel like what they're doing is a value and that they're valued in the processes that they undertake. And especially during a pandemic where everybody's remote and people are losing jobs and people are trying to understand their value and where you used to just get together with people and have a five minute conversation, uh, people are overwhelmed with, you know, life obviously right now and just, you know, understanding where they fit within the company. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's a big part of it. I think that the, I think the younger designers too, uh, you know, from a generational perspective, it, uh, the generational arguments out there, um, I find to be a, a huge waste of effort and time, frankly. Um, you know, the world I, you and I grew up in, we, we grew up building the internet. We grew up the first half of our lives without the internet. We built the tools yeah. that got us to today. I mean, having to code and to learn Photoshop and HTML and XML just to get podcasts up, uh, just to get a design up. And you fast forward 20 years later and the tools that we have access to now, like Figma, Sketch, InDesign, UX Pin. There's even a, a product out called Animia now um, that actually exports a high fidelity mockups straight to React code. So when you Design. look at when you look at the work that we had to do, the millennials are growing up in North America. The millennials are growing up in a world, right? That I can't I can't understand, right? Just like the Gen Zs behind them are growing up are are living in a world that neither one of us can understand. So you know, one of the ideas I, I proposed at a talk I gave at Shopify at World IA Day in 2018 was, you know, if you want to know, you know, who your users are, you should be looking to your grandchildren. Um, because at the end of the day, we live in a global community now. The With all of the things going on in the world, uh, I think we have a responsibility to be, you know, helping the next generation do better than, than me. I, I want the millennials to do and be Please. better than I am. You, you, they, we every generation has to get better in, yeah. ethically, uh, in every sense of the world, from a business perspective. In, in my opinion, anyway. And I think our job at this point isn't to stand in the way. It's it's to it's to have conversations like this. It's for you to share the different tools that help people to think differently about things and to consider other possibilities. Um, because it can't just be, um, you know, it can't. I don't think it can just be you know, a regimented process that we all get online and follow all the time. Um, because otherwise, how are we going to look to different ideas that are going to, that are going to help us step forward and not just, not just from society's perspective, but how do we, how do we motivate people to find that, that kind of joy that you, we experienced growing up, you know, building all of these things because the internet back in the day, in my experience, when it started, um, you know, it, it brought everybody together. People were literally at that perception, conception stage for years trying to figure out, well, what could this be? And it united a lot of different, you know, industries and disciplines to try to figure out, okay, wh where do I fit? How can, yeah. how can I make this work? Um, and so it would be great to be able to get back to that because now we have all the information, right? We're overwhelmed with it. And I understand we need to slow down to think about these things a little more deeply. Um, but I think the possibilities are, are absolutely incredible. I mean, what we, what we should do is can now be the conversation instead of what we could be doing. Exactly. And, and you know what, Jeff, like, and, and I just want to see if this resonates with you because this is, this made me think about something that um, was shared with me by a, like a executive once. And it, it was actually quite a surprising and it's, it's a little bit out of context, but I think it makes sense here potentially. Let's, let's try. Um, uh, we had a meeting and uh, she said to me that, um, you know, I was in this big organization. I was getting a bit frustrated with, the, with all the rules and, the, and, the, and it was just insane. And what she said to me back then is like, Vanner, first of all, try and understand the rules and all the things. Understand why they are there. Follow them. Look at them. And then when you've mastered that, then start, start bending them and changing them. And see how you can work around them. Not not by breaking the rules and doing dodgy things, but just working around. And I wonder if it isn't the same for a lot of the stuff that we do, because I think it, it makes sense to understand some of the things and where some of the design stuff came from. Understand design thinking where it comes from, uh, but then don't pray at the altar of design thinking. Think about how you can challenge that. Think how you can reshape it. 
How can you make it work for yourself? Because that's one thing that I really care about too. Is like, how can you make some of these tools work for you? Change it. Mix it up. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah, it, 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 it absolutely does. Um, yes, because especially, and that, that speaks to a, a larger point as well, you know, understand, and well, to your point, excuse me, understand the organization you're in, right? If you really want to be creative and innovative, the larger the organization you work in, and dependent upon the budget they have for specific things, the less likely you are going to be able to be creative and innovative, right? So it depends on the organization, right? What is the product you're working in and who are the people you get to work with, right? Understand that. If you join a massive corporation that's worth half a billion dollars, that has a design system in place, that's engineering led, you know, you're likely not going to be able to do a lot of creative work. Right. But it could be a great opportunity to learn agile. It would be a great opportunity yeah. to learn design systems. Right. So but if you really want to be to the other end of the spectrum in terms of creative, then you need to be looking at either a startup or a business that's maybe 20 to 100 people in size. So you can build those relationships and you can you can do all the work. And uh, would that be a recommendation for a, for a, I mean, I mean, not that this is really dedicated to teaching people design or whatever, uh, the, but would you recommend that, that as a new designer, maybe drop into like a bigger corporation or is it really about what you're looking for? If you want to be more creative, drop into the, into the startup space, because I know I, I, for example, I've got a good friend. I mean, he's not a junior, but uh, he's seeking out to be a bit more creative and, and challenge things a little bit more. And, and he went into the startup world because it gives him a lot more freedom to do that kind of stuff. Um, is that a senior junior thing or is it more an attitude thing? I think it's an attitude thing. I, I think it depends on, you know, what you, what people are really looking for. Um, you know, it's, um, I, I think a lot of it is about asking questions during the interview process and, and knowing who you are and what you want, right? 20, 20, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I, you know, I look back, I'm 48, 48 years old. Uh, yeah, I know, the cane's <laughs> coming. It's all right. It's all right. I, I'm, ha I, I'm good. I guess my point is, joking aside, I know who I am. I'm good with me, but I've, I've, I've lived life, right? Like I've had many wonderful experiences um, and I've worked hard. Well, that's ridiculous. Everybody works hard. I've worked hard and I've been very lucky and I came in at the, at the right time in different places and were given phenomenal opportunities by incredibly gracious people uh, hmm. to, be able to, to be able to share those ideas and to help other people. Um, so all I can say is, you know, at, at 28 or 25, I can look back now thinking that, you know, I, would, I could solve every problem. And, and in I didn't know anything. Right. So the more experiences you get, the more areas you dive into, the more people you talk to in industries that have perspectives that aren't yours. Uh, talk to engineers, learn some code. You know, you don't have to master code. You don't have to be able to talk in detail about the platform, but you should be able to go and talk to the engineer and go, I've heard this thing called a code stack. Yeah. What is that? Why does that matter? How does that impact my ability to do design and where are you running into problems or how can I better help you and product management reach their goals? Because if I'm doing that, I can help the executive teams reach their goals, right? So I think it's about always learning. You're, you're going to get different opportunities to learn in different organizations and different sizes of organizations. I think it really just depends on, um, it really depends on what you find at any particular company. Yeah. It's, it's like, it made me like think of this term, you need to have pervasive curiosity. Like, and it's not just curiosity about the customers, but about a, yeah. a, the design team, the business guys. But Jeff, I, I think we need to wrap it up. Like you say, like, uh, except for my mom and, 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 and a, a ton of other people, the rest of the world is out drinking beers. And, uh, of course they are. you know, like, uh, we're going to have to do that. And I know Christina is also waiting to, uh, to hang out with you a little bit in your awesome little house there in Canada and Ottawa, right? Um, how old is that house again? It's it was it's it's, it's about an hour outside of Ottawa. It was built in 1830. It's an old stone house, so we're renovating, and we've it's a forever home. We've got forever, but uh, wonderful community and and very lucky. And if you're watching this, you need to go check out Jeff's um, Instagram feed because you see these awesome photos from the farm. I'm a bit jealous, Jeff. And then also you've got this big Saint Bernard run, running around there. You've got a really awesome life there, you and Christina. It looks idyllic, to be honest. 
yeah, very, we're, we're very lucky and, and very grateful. And, and again, we didn't get here. We didn't get here by ourselves. That's for sure. So thanks very much for the opportunity to share Werner and, uh, yeah. and uh, for everyone that's helped me along with the way. But before you go, Jeff, and before the internet gods cut us off completely, right? Um, there is, of course, always, as always, a tool. And I'm not referring to myself. I'm referring to, um, <laughs> I'm referring to two card decks that you actually shared as well. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift over to the screen here and try and be like fancy. This is one that you, that you shared from uh, back in the, in the design day. I think this is an IDEO one, right? It is. They're IDEO method cards. So um, IDEO created these cards a long, long time ago. I don't, I don't even know if they're available anymore. Um, but they, they broke them up into uh, different categories along the top. Um, so you can see the different ones that are highlighted. Uh, I think the camera journal is one that I've, I've used in the past where people actually have to take their phones and take pictures of their day in terms of like a service construct to be able to yeah. share the different experiences they have. But again, they're, they're really just designed to you know, be either quick exercises or, or long-term constructs to be able to move the conversation outside of the corporate language and, and be able to inspire people to consider ideas they hadn't otherwise considered. Yeah, I think there's a, there's another smaller set that they've also done that's kind of similar that helps you do field work and a bit of tips and, and, and things that, that's mm -hmm. quite interesting. And then the other one that you sent me, which unfortunately I went to check, you can't get any more, but... I don't know if the if if you, the people that are watching this can see this, but the, the the creative work on these cards are beautiful. Yeah, this was built by a, a, a colleague of mine, Stephen P. Anderson, who just accepted uh, I think the design strategy director role at Mural M U R A L. Yeah, I'm a, um, a keen user of Mural. Yeah, and Stephen's a, a class act, a very very nice guy, and and very very smart and. Um, uh, he, he created these based on a lot of psychology principles, uh, you know, limited choice, the idea that the more choices you have with you, that you present people, the less certain they are of the, that they've made the right decision, which obviously impacts products and, and web services, uh, pattern recognition, you know, be able to spot things and find things, how your reputation, commitment and consistency, uh, how much visual Im imagery um, plays a part chunking which is basically like categorization and information architecture but they also tie in he ties in logical principles to all of these things so it's not just best practices and design it's it's actually tied to psycho psychological constructs and that and that's what i think is quite interesting about this set is, is like uh, because for 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 some of us who come from a dev background like myself like the psychological constructs is, is quite hard to get into, and these makes it, make it quite easy to just get a quick reference. We'll have to see if we can twist his arm to bring them back. Yeah, well, we can, I'm happy to reach out to him and see if he's willing to, you know, print some more up to uh, get them on, online. We'll see. Especially for his keen fans in Poland. Come on. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, Jeff, I'm going to wrap this up, sir. I mean, I'm, I'm honored and hopefully you'll, you'll uh, be uh, willing to come back and join us again. I've, there's a few comments came in uh, and not from my mom. Uh, we, we had one from, from, a, from our friend, Yuri. Um, he's always a legend from Belarus um, saying that he enjoyed watching us. But then again, he's a bit, um, he's biased, right? And then uh, uh, Jonathan Gull from, from, from YouTube um, really giving you a, a thumbs up for, um, for the, the framework. Um, I'm sure, Jonathan, we'll have more of a discussion about that soon as well. And then a fellow South African, I met him this week. Um, super discussion. He thanked me, Jeff, but it's all you, man. It's all you. <laughs> no, it, it, it has nothing to do with me. Joshua knows exactly who to thank. You're the one that's providing the platform. So cool. cheers. Cool. And uh, a few other people popped in. Thank you for the comments and, and watching. Um, Jeff, um, I, I think at some stage I gave a URL and I'll post it in the caption of this where people can actually go read some of your musings because sometimes you put pen to paper or is it hand to keyboard to, to write? Is there, where can people find you, follow you and, 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 and kind of um, just see what you're up to? Yeah, well, I don't know who uses Twitter anymore for anything but, about complaining, but I'm at Jeff I, I know Parks who's not using Twitter. That, okay, that's a bad job. No, yeah, well, we're not going into politics, man. I'm not doing that. Uh, and then the blog I created uh, late last year is jeffreyparks.ca, so J-E-F-F-E-R-Y, 
parks.ca and and it's just it, it's really just intended to share some different takes on things so if you're if you're looking for best practices and and you know how to how to design and whatnot you're not going to find anything there um it's more about sharing some experiences after 20 years of about very much like we we're talking about today how to how to think about things a little bit differently and consider and other ideas sometimes it's good especially in this this time where i mean we don't i don't think we always realize how much mentally we're taking strain during this uh, little shared experience of ours so it's uh, i can really recommend to go check out your blog jeff i mean i read a few of your articles they're really useful and jeff i just want to say thank you to you again uh for for being willing to do this um and um, joining me on a live stream here i really appreciate it and hopefully you'll come back and uh, do this again so thank you very much thank you Werner. all the best my friend you take care cool and uh, okay. thank you for watching this. Um, I'm going to just do some gratuitous um, self-promotion. I've got a video, and I think that side, and it's, whoop, there's my finger. Um, it's out, and it's on LinkedIn, and you can see it also on my YouTube channel, um, where I talk a little bit about um, the UX pressure, um, customer journey mapping, and also persona design. So go check that out. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. I'm currently working on one or two more videos to bring more tools that sits on the conceptual side. And like Jeff just spoke about, we also need to think about the formalization. So not just about playing with blocks and stuff. It's really like trying to do some real meaningful work. And then finally, just to point this out, you can find me at experience.consulting or reach out to me there. But also you can keep an eye on me and all this work that we are doing. And I'm uh, bringing in some more people on YouTube. And then uh, in the next uh, session, hopefully next week, uh, I'm going to be introducing you guys to... Um, Shauna and Tamara, and I'm not going to say this, her name is Albera, if I'm remembering correctly. They are from Traction Strategy. We can talk a little bit about some of the tools that I've covered in some of my previous videos, how to apply them, some of the practical application, and maybe some of the new things that they're working on. So excited to do that. And uh, once again, I want to thank you for watching. And as always, catch you in the comments. Ciao.